Thanks. Welcome to the screencast for The Principle of Alternative Possibilities by Harry Frankfurt and The Capacities of Agents by Neil Levy. The first article starts on page 181 in our textbook. So far in our unit about free will, we've encountered some definitions. Absolute free will, uh, hard determinism, and the middle ground, which is compatibilism or libertarianism. So those are four different sorts of viewpoints you can have on the idea of free will. Frankfurt takes a little bit of another tack. He wants to argue, using a thought experiment, that it doesn't matter for moral responsibility whether or not we live in a deterministic world. First thing he does is name the idea that we could have done otherwise, the principle of alternative possibilities. So we all have this idea that in the past, in decisions that we made, we could have chosen something else. And that's all the principle of alternative possibilities is. If you think that the principle of alternative possibilities is true, then you probably believe in free will of some sort, compatibilist or otherwise. If you believe that the principle of alternative possibilities is false, then you think that we live in a deterministic universe. So if we live in a deterministic universe, uh, it goes along with that, that we don't have moral responsibility for our actions. Because how could we? We're just programmed to act as if we do. And if we believe it's true, then we do save our moral responsibility, our responsibility for all of our actions. But we have a tough time escaping causality. He doesn't really care about it. He instead generates a thought experiment to show that it doesn't matter. And if you end up agreeing with his thought experiment, even if we live in a deterministic universe, we're still responsible for our actions. So here's the thought experiment. There are two people, Jones and Black. Jones is facing a choice. He can pick A or he can pick B. Black wants Jones to pick A. So if Jones decides all on his own to pick A, Black will not interfere. But if Jones picks B, Black will interfere. And that interference could be external or internal. So maybe he just tackles him and makes him do the other thing, or he threatens him. So these are external constraints on Jones's free will. You can also imagine a scenario where uh, Black implanted a computer chip inside Jones's head, or he uh, drugged him, did something that he that Jones wouldn't be aware of to force him to choose the A option. So Jones doesn't have alternative possibilities, but he doesn't know that yet. He'll always end up performing the A action but he thinks he has a choice. Now, the only scenario we care about for this thought experiment is when Jones decides of his own volition to perform A. He chose to do A, which is what Black wanted him to do. So, Black doesn't interfere whatsoever. Jones ends up not knowing that he did not have alternative possibilities. He was in a deterministic situation or context. But he chose his own volition to choose A, and so therefore he's responsible for A. A and B could be anything in the world, but since we're concerned with responsibility for our actions, what's usually given is some morally abhorrent choice. So to shoot someone, uh, to hurt someone, to steal something but it could really just be as simple as turning right or left. So even if the scenario is highly unlikely, Frankfurt wanted to show that if we're put into a deterministic situation, as long as you act on your own volition, you're still responsible for your own actions. Black doesn't even enter into the equation because Jones chose all by himself. 
Now people will automatically say, but he didn't really have another option because he'd be forced in the other situation. And we're just ignoring that completely because the only thing that matters is there is a possibility in this universe where there's a deterministic situation and you still chose. Now, Neil Levy has a rebuttal to this in the next article. Um, it's on, hmm, I forget which page it's on, but it is directly after the article for Frankfurt. And he's going to focus on that other arm of the two choices that Jones faced, the one where the outside person does interfere. But this time, instead of thinking of a morally abhorrent situation, he's going to think about A as a good choice. So Levy's central claim is that the context matters when we make choices. The environments that we're in can't be completely separated to whatever's going on inside our heads, even if it doesn't seem like the context does, like in Harry Frankfurt's example. He starts out his article by acknowledging that it appears as if people arguing on the opposite sides, either for determinism or for free will, are at an impasse. And it depends on what you mean by intentions. It depends on what you mean by free will, whether it's external or internal. But then Frankfurt came along with his Frankfurt style cases and seemingly demonstrated that it doesn't matter whether or not we live in a deterministic world we are still responsible. But he proposes an inverse sort of case called Frankfurt enabler cases. First, he gives a typical Frankfurt style case. And instead of shooting someone, this is about voting. He says, Connie is at a voting booth, but she hasn't decided who to vote for yet. There's one particular issue that she cares deeply about. And if she thinks about it, then she'll vote Democrat. If she doesn't think deeply about that particular issue, she'll vote Republican. Now, if she starts to think deeply, an evil neuroscientist who's embedded this chip in her brain unbeknownst to her will stop her from thinking deeply about the issue and she'll vote Republican. But on her own volition, she does not think deeply and she chooses the Republican on her own. So this is the standard Frankfurt style case. She chose on her way, her own way uh, how to vote, but she did not have an alternative possibility, even though she thought she did. We're trying to ignore the intervener completely. It seems on first glance that the neuroscientist doesn't have any role in her choice. But Levy does not agree that this is the case. He thinks we make the fatal mistake of ignoring what capacities the agent has and how they change over time and dependent on what context you're in. So here's his counter argument, this, this Frankfurt enabling case. Jillian's walking along the beach and she notices someone drowning. Now she's a really good swimmer. She learned to swim in a pool and she practices every day, but she's extremely phobic about deep water. So she never goes into the ocean. And if she tried to rescue the person, she would immediately panic, an uncontrollable chemical reaction in her brain, and she would fail at the rescue. But she does have the capacity to try to attempt to rescue the person. So that would be her volition. She would choose to swim out, she'd panic, and she'd fail. So she tries. She starts to run out into the water. But unbeknownst to her, a good neuroscientist has implanted a chip in her brain. And when she runs out to attempt the rescue, it dampens the phobia. It takes away the fear response. So the rescue succeeds. And in this instance, we cannot ignore the intervener. It ha the intervener has an, a critical role in Jillian's choice and action. So Levy's argument is that in both cases, the environment around our agents, the people who we're choosing to act, affect and change what the agents are capable of. So external world factors change what we can possibly choose to do. 
and we cannot ignore that. If we can't ignore it in the Jillian Good situation, we can't ignore it in the Connie Bad situation. Levy acknowledges that there aren't neuroscientists putting chips in our brain when we're sleeping, but the complex situations that we find ourselves in every day change us all of the time, change what abilities we have to choose to act or not act. And if we can't ignore it, like I said, in the good circumstance, we can't ignore them in the bad circumstance. Jillian gained a capacity to act from the intervener. Uh, she, there was the volition plus the act. While Connie in her voting booth and Jones in Frankfurt's original case lost a capacity to act, even if they didn't know it. So it's up to you now to think which philosopher has the better argument. Does context matter or is it only intention that matters regardless of whether or not we have free will? when it comes to moral responsibility. Does the environment which changes what we can choose to do matter more or the same as whatever it is inside our heads that makes us desire what we desire? That's another way to put it.